Hey everybody, welcome back to the Dr. V Podcast. I'm your host, Jesse Verga. Today I have an amazing guest. Her name is Renisha Nation, which it's so weird to say that because when I met her, she was Chief Nation. I served with her when I was in the military. After I got out, she went on to make Master Chief, which is E9 for all you non-Navy folks or military folks. It's the highest rank you can achieve as an enlisted service member. After she retired, she went on to become an amazing realtor's and amazing brokers I have ever met. She is a wealth of knowledge. She also started her very own business where she helps new business owners and established businesses fill in gaps and achieve their full potential and grow. So without further ado, let's get into the interview. Hey, that rhymed. Well, first of all, let me say thank you for uh, having me today and giving me the opportunity to be a part of your platform. I know that uh, managing a platform and choosing the right selection of people is is hard. So I appreciate you for just giving me a chance to be here and speak to your audience. So a little bit about me. Um, I'm from Atlanta, Georgia, born and raised there. I left there when I was about 19 and joined the Navy, as you know, where we met. And uh, I was an air traffic controller for 20 years. Um, For anybody who don't know what the Navy rank structure and how it goes, but I progressed up to Master Chief, which is the head of the air traffic control uh, world. But I chose to get out and continue uh, my business in real estate. So I started real estate while on active duty. Um, I became a realtor started buying and investing in real estate. And one thing that I learned in that process is that a lot of people don't move because of fear. And I wanted to help break that down because what I learned is there is wealth building in real estate. And if you don't move because of fear, you miss out on opportunities for your personal growth. So I started doing real estate, started doing real estate training and really started to uh, try to encourage and inspire people and break down those uh, limiting beliefs that they could be successful in real estate. And then as I grew in real estate, I became a real estate broker and I had to start learning business management, right? And really, really learning um, how to run a business. So I went to University of San Diego. I got my MBA. And um, as I was struggling through learning really the nuances of business, which I'm sure you had your ups and downs with figuring out, it's always a daily thing, right? Um, I recognize that there's a a large gap in learning business and people want to be successful, but they don't have the tools. And a lot of times we miss out on opportunities because we don't have the tools. Our our business aren't properly set up or properly structured. So if you're a business that goes after government contracts, because we just had a huge storm last week, but some businesses won't be able to go out and take advantage of those government opportunities because they're not properly structured. So um, seeing that gap, I joined, I um, created EIN to Win Training Academy, which is a training academy designed to help entrepreneurs legitimize their businesses, um, properly structure and set up systems so that they can be successful and be able to take advantage of opportunities. So that's my quick. uh, Yeah, that was (laughs) really good. That was that was to the point. I'm always so bad at that when people say like, make it like, you know, give an intro. I'm here for like 30 minutes. <laughs> no, that was awesome. I actually didn't know that you made Master Chief. So that's incredible. Yeah. Thank- I met you as Chief Nation on the America. America yep. yep. And then I, yeah, I left shortly after that. So I didn't really, uh, I didn't know that you progressed through the ranks. And for anybody who doesn't know, that's like as high as you can go in terms of rank structure on the enlisted side is E9. And that's where you were at. So that's incredible. I don't know how I didn't know that. So that's my bad. Hey, did you guys know that at the end of this video, there is a riddle and there has been a riddle at the end of every single one of my videos every single week. Now in the past, I would leave you guys the answers. I have decided to remove the answers from being at the end screen. And now the first person to correctly answer the riddle in the comments below, I will pin that comment. And maybe one day when this channel grows and I get some sponsors, I'll be able to give you guys some free stuff for guessing the riddle correctly. But with that, let's get back into the video. But okay, so you are from Atlanta, Georgia, which I think mm-hmm. is interesting. So do you find that being from the South or being specifically from Atlanta, like a major metropolitan area in the Southeast, Do you find that that contributed to your overall success in the military and subsequently after the military? So I would say no to that. I think that um, 
I was from a small, a small area of West Atlanta called Douglasville. And what I learned growing up in the South <laughs> is a lot of things are very black and white, you know, Bible Belt. And a lot of uh, the mindset there is very limiting in what you can accomplish and what you can do. And I joined the military to get away from that um, and to try to give myself an opportunity to experience life different. And my intentions wasn't to do 20 years like most people who joined. <laughs> it was to just do four and four and move on. But I ended up staying in. I found success and I like what I was doing as an air traffic controller. And um, but yeah, so I would say no. I would say that uh, getting out and meeting people outside of my small world, um, outside because even though you know. I was from, I'm from Atlanta, from West Atlanta, I'm from all over Atlanta. We moved a lot growing up as kids, but my neighborhood, the people who I grew up with, the people who I saw every day, they weren't really excelling. They weren't doing a lot of stuff. Um, so getting joining the military, meeting a new demographic and a new group of people and seeing people like you, uh, I learned so much from you guys, just like being ready and willing and able and confident to step outside of your shells and do something different. And um, that inspired me to try to do things and do different things. So that's what I would say. That's interesting. Cause I remember you as a chief, you were one of my favorite chiefs oh, because you. you weren't an asshole and you were, <laughs> like, you were, I mean, I remember going through East Was and like all the interactions I had with you kind of in CIC, it was always like extremely, um, like you earned my respect just by being who you were as a leader. And I think that a lot of junior sailors like myself at the time found that extremely difficult because we're coming from all walks of life and you expect to meet other people in uniform that are going to, you know, kind of provide you the same respect, but you don't get that all the time from leadership. So it's mm -hmm. like a breath of fresh air when you finally meet a leader who's like that. So I was super excited when we we're talking about having you on the podcast. I'm like, that would be dope. Cause thank you. You were, you were awesome then. And knowing that you made master chief, like you don't <laughs> just make master chief. That's not like, that's beyond just who, you know, that's a hundred percent about how you are in your position, at least from my experience with the master chiefs that I've met, like master chief Clift and, and so on. Oh yeah. He's awesome. Yeah. I still keep in touch with him. He's, he's great. Um, you know, well, Facebook helps, right? Facebook helps keep in touch yeah. with folks. So <laughs> Um, so you, you mentioned something that I thought was interesting and that was the uh, fear of moving. So can you talk a little bit about that and a little bit about some of the challenges and hurdles your clients kind of have to overcome as they enter the real estate sphere? Yeah. So I started real estate in San Diego. And if you know San Diego or you hear California real estate market, it's super expensive, especially when you compare it to real estate in Georgia, compare it to real estate in Florida. And also, you know, my generation of people, people they experienced the real estate crash in um, 2008. So they have fear in that area. They've seen that happen. And in San Diego, being the real estate was so expensive, uh, people was really scared. Like, I ain't buying here. You know, it's too much. And um, they were giving their money to people. What? So my experience, I'll back it up just a step. I tried to buy a house in 2000 and what year was that? 2011, 2010, 2011. I was in station in Pensacola, Florida. And I called this realtor. I didn't have a clue about what to do, what steps to take. But, you know, you back then it wasn't like Zillow and all that stuff. So you drive around. I seen the sign on the house that I liked. Then I called the realtor and she was like, are you pre-approved? Because if you're not pre-approved, blah, blah, blah. And I just hung up the phone because it it scared me and intimidated me. I was like, what in the world? So I didn't buy again until I got to Chula Vista. And I lived in an apartment, Chula Vista is uh, South San Diego, but I lived in an apartment um, called Cordovera. And right across the street, they were building a new construction community. And I literally walked across the street and they were so polite. They helped me through the process and it was just so easy. And so I said, my fear in that moment of, you know, I just like, I don't know when, you know, that was uh, three, four years later. And I was so, so mad at that realtor because I think about how much money I lost in those years yeah. if I would have been able to buy, buy the house that I wanted. So 
again, you talk, you asked me about fear and people's fear with, with moving. They come into it and because they don't have experience or because they haven't seen any success or because they've seen the failures of what was happening when the real estate market crashed, it's like, I'm not doing that because what they don't see is the possibilities that they have if they move forward. What they don't see is the fact that, yeah, I'm buying a house that's 300000 in San Diego, but if we talk about 20% national growth over the nation, 20% of 300000 is going to earn me way more money than 20% off of a $100,000 house that I might get in, in Georgia. So why don't you take that opportunity Get that money and then go buy your house in the state that you're you're comfortable with. Because at the end of the day, you're paying that mortgage anyway. You just may not be getting the equity. Somebody else is probably getting it. So a lot of people have fear because they don't know the process. They don't understand it. Or it just seems like for me, I grew up project kid. You know, we lived with people house to house, back and forth. And um, the idea of actually owning a house, it's just not even something people think about. Like that ain't for me. That's the, that's for other people. I say, people say the dream is for other people. That dream don't belong to me because that's not my life story. So just trying to break down those mental barriers to help encourage people. That is the first step. And it's hard when you grew up a certain way or you've seen certain things that make you, it's like, you don't want to touch that stove because you know it's hot. You know what I mean? And that's what I experience with people and their fear of moving forward in that or, or different wealth building opportunities, which I know you know quite a few. So. Yeah, no, I think that's interesting because um, I'm not from the South, but I'm from the South Bronx. And uh, and it's the same. I 100%, I agree. It's like, it's so foreign and so scary to think that this thing is mine. I own this. And it's a sense of accomplishment, but it comes with like so much that you don't know because you didn't grow up mowing a lawn and you didn't grow up, you know, fixing stuff around the house. It was always like, this doesn't belong to me. So uh, I think, yeah, I, I think about when I bought my first house, I, uh, I bought, I got my first house when I was really young. I was uh, uh, 23 when I bought my first house, but it was because I had mentors like you and other people that were like telling me about the appreciation and even, even the term appreciation to me was so like, okay, so this thing is going to make me money. Like, <laughs> okay, like let's give it a shot. But yeah, San Diego, if anybody doesn't know, a lot of realtors out here are vultures. They're not really yeah. here for your best interest. So having someone like you, who's kind of going to like hold your hand and explain to you the benefits and do what's best for you in terms of finding a place. Cause I remember my very first realtor in San Diego, she took me to these like crappy houses that her company were, was trying to sell. And she wow. was just trying to get me to buy one of those houses. And in my mind, I'm thinking like, okay, it's in my price range, which wasn't much, right? I had made E6 at that point. I'm like, I don't know if if I can afford the repairs, like to even be able to live here. It wasn't until I got out and was able to like get a little bit more money under like uh, like a larger salary, I guess. I ended up working at Navor. But um, yeah, it wasn't until I got more money and actually left San Diego and found a realtor in Riverside County who was like, provided who gave me what you would have given me had you been a realtor at that time you were too busy making master chief and stuff so. <laughs> <laughs> no it's okay um no that's really interesting so if you can for our veteran listeners because most of our community here is they're veterans um hey, if you um, can kind of, yeah <laughs> um if you can kind of go through what that process looks like for veterans especially with their va loan because when I talk to other veterans, they don't realize that they can pull their VA loan COE off of a property and use it to buy another property, and which is what I've done. I own several properties, and it's because of that. And I wish more veterans would take advantage of that opportunity because they earned it, right? So if you can kind of go through that process, like start to finish, what it looks like for veterans. Yeah. So first thing I would say is buyers, you are up. <laughs> um, and what I mean by that, we're in a market where people got comfortable with the, what we call it the COVID market, where we had about six weeks worth of inventory. And now nationwide in San Diego, I think we have two and a half months worth of inventory. And I think on a nationwide level, the average is between four to six months. And where I am currently right now in Tampa, it's about five months. And I say that to say, 
even though we consider a balanced market three to six months, that means, you know, you can negotiate price. The prices ain't going crazy, driving high um, because people are used to that COVID six weeks. I, I better put an offer in now or, or else. Um, they think that, you know, the market is struggling, but it's really just balanced market based off of history. And be, but because of that mindset, it goes back to mindset. Um, sellers are given so many incentives to buyers right now to take advantage of. So I will say this, um, if you guys have paid attention to the market or at, at all, you will hear like about the interest rates and interest rates supposed to drop, blah, blah, blah. What happened in COVID years is the interest rate stayed at two, three percent for too, too long. And what that did was created an infl infl I'm sorry. I'm, I'm about to mess up the word, so I'm going to change it. <laughs> but yeah, they yeah. did draw the prices up astronomical. And yeah. now trying to control that, the prices are here. And then the government trying to control it, they raised the interest rates to here. So what created what it created was a situation of, of unaffordability. So people can't afford to buy it because buying a house, you got this high interest rate at 7%, plus you got this high mortgage that was a result of the inflation, right? So now... People been on the sidelines, kind of waiting, you know, jumping in, jumping out. So what happens now is they're looking at lowering the interest rate because they balanced the market, which was the goal. Let's balance this market so we can quit driving the prices up. But because buyers have been on the sideline, when they drop those interest rates a couple of times, I've already started getting more calls from buyers trying to pick up. For VA, for veterans, you guys, maybe you've heard, maybe you haven't, but one of the biggest things that you earned was that VA loan. That is a starting point for building wealth for you. And with that VA loan, you can go and you can purchase a home with zero money down and no private mortgage insurance requirement, which saves you money over the course of the loan. But what it is, is there is a cap, depending on what state you live in, um, your VA loan there, even though they say now it, things changed over the last few years where you can get what you qualify for. When you start to look at purchasing multiple properties under that same VA loan, which is possible, um, every state has like a cap. So if you build some equity, you buy a house and you don't buy it at the tip top of the market, you're likely to have still uh, some VA eligibility remaining where you can use that VA loan again in a different state or in a different location if you get transferred and um, be able to purchase another home. Or if you're smart like Jesse, you hold on to your asset and you allow that equity build up so that you can get at least 20% of equity, refinance it, and then be able to pull that VA loan if you to, to buy another house too. So your VA loan is not just a one-time use. And another thing is if you are out of the military and you get uh, at least a 0%, um, a 0 disability rating, you no longer have what's called a VA funding fee. Every loan, no matter which loan product you use, is going to have some level of funding fee associated with it. Um, but if you're out, you have no VA funding fee. So you just use the heck out of that VA loan to save yourself money on no PMI, no money out down. So that saves you money. You don't have to give up $50,000 or, you know, $80,000 to buy an asset. You can keep that money in your pocket and be able to continue to purchase uh, other other assets um, for you to build wealth. Hey guys, I wanted to interrupt this video real quick and remind you that my free guide, Wellness, Wisdom, and Warfare, A Veteran's Guide for Mastering Life is now available for download using the link in the description. Or if you go to my website, jessieverga.com slash free guide, or it's under the podcast tab. You can download it for absolutely free. It's over 60 pages of just tips and tricks and things to help my veterans out there master their health, master their fitness, master their mental and spiritual health. Just things that I've learned through my journey as just a veteran and that I've learned as an educator and as a professional in multiple fields, as an entrepreneur, I put all these things in one place and I've put it together for absolutely free. So again, link is in the description or if you head to my website, jessieverga.com, you can download it for absolutely free. Yeah, that's what I, I found. Um, I always forget that. So I'm glad you mentioned that because someone mentioned it to me years ago that you can use your same VA loan until it's capped. So mm -hmm. if it's like 600000 in California, you buy a house for 300000 You can buy another house for 300000 with that same VA loan. 
what I did was I took advantage of those COVID interest rates and I refinanced the property that had the VA loan on it, got like a 2% interest rate, pulled the VA loan off, pulled out a little bit of money from that, like a HELOC, um, home equity line of credit, and kind of fixed that house up to pro- to increase the rent price, to rent it to, mm-hmm. I mean, I still, I, in terms of like the houses that I've purchased and the condos that I've purchased, when I rent them out, I rent them for a fair price, even though they are like, I wouldn't say luxury, but they're in really good neighborhoods. They're, you know, they're modern, they're updated. I still charge a very competitive rent price, but because rent prices everywhere went up, you know, if my condo, like I have a property, excuse me, I have a property and the mortgage is $1,700 a month, which is like Mm -hmm. unheard of in California for a three bedroom, two bath. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I charge a little bit over that. And there's like a NOI calculation that I use as a, as a, um, as a landlord, I guess. And what I do is I charge a little bit more. So I put a little bit of money away for repairs or anything that might happen. But then because there is a difference, instead of making a profit, I use that quote unquote profit to pay the mortgage of the house that I live in. Mm -hmm. So I end up having not to pay any mortgage here And I think if if more veterans understood that process, like buy and hold, it is risky renting, especially with squatters rights in California. But if you write a solid lease or find a good property manager, like you could buy and just like continue to buy. I think the VA though, correct me if I'm wrong, you have to live in the property for a year, I think is the... I found a little bit of a workaround with that. Mm -hmm. Most Most of my properties I've lived in, but the last one I purchased... I wrote a letter to like point of contact on the VA loan. My lender at the time, she retired now, but she helped me and basically was like, yeah, so because of work, I can't live here the full year. And I had no issues with putting Mm -hmm. renters in there. They just responded and said that they uh, waived the one year requirement. And I got a, I got a letter back a couple months later. So so when you buy your house with a VA loan, your it has to be your intentions is to move in that house and make it your primary residence. You can't buy a house with a VA loan unless you're assuming a loan, which is another conversation. Um, but you can't buy a, a with a VA loan with the intent as an investor, technically, right? Yep. Um, for tax purposes, you should live in that house for two years, but. There, oh, because when you because when you go to sell it, one of the things they're going to say, hey, have for for uh, property gains. I'm sorry. Yeah. To make sure that you don't get hit with those uh, gains, those uh, mm-hmm. those gains on your taxes. You know, so um, you get up to two hundred and fifty thousand, though. Uh, I'm sorry. I don't know what's going on with me, but you get up okay. to two hundred and fifty thousand dollars of uh, free Good taxes credit. if you live there oh. for two years. But. If you didn't live there for two years, then they'll hit you for those capital gains. That's what I was trying to say. For oh, those right, capital right. gains taxes. Um, but there are different things that will allow you to uh, waive that two-year requirement, even for federal level. And one of them is if you have a job that moved you to a, a different area. So uh, even if you go to try to sell within that two years, um, when they're when you're going through escrow or title or anything, they're going to say, well, did you live here for two years? Yes or no? You say no, you're going to need to be prepared to justify what happened. And it needs to be in uh, in accordance with one of those options that the government or that they give you to um, get out of it, the IRS, um, so you won't get hit with that extra ta- capital gains tax. So yeah. just a little yeah. little hit for you. Yeah, but, and that, I mean, no, that's good. I think and it's important that people realize that that capital gains. So when you sell a property and you owe, you know, you owe three hundred thousand, but you sell it for five hundred thousand, like you have to pay something called capital gains. So yeah. you're not going to get that two hundred thousand dollar difference as a pure profit. Like you have to pay taxes and all of these other things, and um, and and that's what you're referring to. So mm-hmm. I, my stepfather, uh, he um. He just sold his property and his capital gains was through the roof. And I'm like, dang. Can I, add, can, I, can I add on to that? Sure, so yeah. as a, if you live there for two years and you whatever, um, and you may, if you're single, you get up to $250,000 
uh, uh, before you get hit with the capital gains. But that's oh, if you okay. live there. If mm -hmm. you were married, you get up to 500000 of capital gains, which if you had a house prior, prior to COVID on the West Coast, it's possible, depending on the type of house that you have, that you could be, you know, have made 300000 in equity over a four or five year period um, on that house. So just be mindful of that and be prepared to justify it. And there are ways that you can bring those taxes down. I'm not a tax professional, but I've sure. done it a little bit. So, mm -hmm. but just be, just ask your uh, CPA on how you can do it, if that's a factor for you. But keep that in mind. Buy and hold is, is a great way of go, especially strategy in this market right now. I would urge, urge, urge buy and holds because real estate is just one of those things. If you hold on to it and you pay your mortgage, guess what? It's not going to change. People worry about what's happening behind the scenes with the market going up and down. Your mortgage rate is just that. It's Unless it's outside of a... Um, what do you call it? In property insurance. And if your taxes go crazy for some reason, but it could be all of this could be just swimming all behind you, but your mortgage is going to stay. So just keep paying that mortgage, whether you let a renter pay it or you paying it because you're living in there, um, but keep paying it. And guess what? Eventually um, it's called a uh, dollar cost average. So it don't matter what's happening. If you look, it's historically you're going to end up on the higher yeah. side but just yeah hold it. yeah i think that's what scares a lot of people and i think going back to your initial statement with kind of like the fear is that they see a volatile market and they assume mm -hmm. that it's gonna it's gonna affect them in the right now but it's like we're talking 20 years and if you look at a 20-year chart of anything there's trend lines yeah so it's not going to be as volatile no i think that's um I think that's really good advice. And we could probably talk real estate all day because I, I know that I would have a ton of questions and like I transfer my properties to LLCs and I do like all sorts mm -hmm. of things. And I think that's a, a definitely an advanced conversation. But for any veteran out there who isn't using their VA loan or who use their VA loan once and maybe had like maybe is thinking about potentially buying another property, I think now is it's it's now or never right like the market's never yeah. going to be in an ideal spot to buy the right now for buyers is crazy i negotiated two properties here where i'm at right now Forty-five thousand each. Um, we pretty much have to walk in the house like seven hundred and fifty thousand dollar house in florida is a three million dollar house in san diego right yeah. um she got to walk in this house and got fifteen hundred dollars back so wow. <laughs> after she, cause you know, you got to pay the deposit to get them to hold it. But yeah. she, she made money off of uh, buying, getting into this property. So it's all about having the right realtor, <laughs> I mean, yeah. but yeah. Um, it's no, all about having the right real estate professional uh, supporting you and knowing the market, but buyers, this is an opportunity. Sellers are nervous because they're not used to mark houses sitting a little bit longer and they are providing incentives and especially in new construction communities it's going crazy so if you got a va loan where you don't have to pay money down and you likely won't have um to pay any closing costs because you can get that in the incentives you're up right now don't don't miss this opportunity out of fear because when those interest rates drop the market is going to go back up it's going to continue to climb it's just what what, what it is we're supply and demand uh, law of economics, supply and demand. We're are we are well under supply. So guess what? The demand is great. They're on the sidelines and they're waiting to get back in the game. Yeah, we probably have to have you back on because I think that we could have a whole other just a whole episode just on real estate. Because I think that you know, so one of my really good friends, she dog sits for a guy who uh, just made chief. He's an LS. Um, he's transferring to the East Coast, but. He's selling his property in San Diego and looking to buy a property in DC. So I was asking, and I don't, I don't know him personally, but I was asking my friend, I was like, why is he selling? Like you own a, a really nice condo in a really nice neighborhood in San Diego. He's a single male and he strategically bought this place. So he would be near in a short either walk or Uber ride to restaurants and bars and things like that. So I'm like, why would you sell that? That's a gold. I mean, for a buyer, that's a gold mine. But for a renter, it's even better considering it's a military community. So when I was asking her some questions, she was like, I don't think he knows that he can you can use his VA loan again. And I'm like, yeah. that's something that a veteran that he's actually he's active duty. But like, that's something that anybody who has access to a VA loan should be made aware of. 
But they just say, hey, by the way, you have a VA loan. And then you go and try to find a realtor in San Diego. And it's just, um, yeah. So, but no, that's great. Like, they yeah, not like I, us. <laughs> I know. I, I honestly, um, I messaged her earlier today. I'm going to send her your information because in hopes that she forwards it to him. I can't remember his name. I'll find out and send it to you because um, I would hate for him to lose a property, especially since he has the intentions of coming back to San Diego. He's from Alabama, so he has no intention yeah. of going back south when he gets out. But um, anyway, no, that's great. I wanted to uh, kind of shift in gears a little bit. I want to talk a little bit about your business um, mm-hmm. and kind of how you are helping startups and newer entrepreneurs, because I think it's fantastic what you're doing. Thank you. So if you want to go into that a little bit. Yeah. So um, EIN to win, what it is, is a cohort style and it's something different than what a lot of people see. Um, A lot of uh, people, they go and they buy information. So I'm going to buy this course. I might get an hour worth of training time with this person, or it may be a three day long training and you get a whole bunch of information given to you. And then when you leave that training, you just got a notebook full of stuff and you really don't know what to do with it. So what we decided to do me and my partner was we do did like a cohort style training. So you can join, um, the training, the next cohort is going to start in January. We're going to start, um, we're going to launch it in November. I'm sorry, the end of this month, October, so that people can start to sign up. But what happens is every month we're going to take you through a certain area of the training. So, for instance, in January, we're going to talk about what business structures are. OK, so we've heard of LLC. We've heard of escorts. We've heard of sole proprietorships. But let's break that down and let's help you identify what is the best structure for you and then give you time to set your business up. And then we're going to have uh, one on one mentors that's going to come in and um, you're going to be able to ask questions directly to myself, directly to my partner. Every training, we're going to have a guest speaker that is an entrepreneur that is very successful in their field. So we have people that are doing music. We have people that are making clothes. We have people that are um, doing movies. So it's all over the spectrum fields, real estate, um, trading, and just different things that people do. Um, they're coming in. They're going to give their expertise. We're going to break down certain elements of business. So we talked about the business structure. We're going to give you an opportunity to set that up and help us to ask questions too. We're going to talk about how to set up marketing programs and processes, um, how to target your market. How, how do you identify your target market? Um, how do you set up your funding, how do you set up, not even just funding, how do you set up so that you can pay attention to your accounting? How can you pay attention to that? And you do it right. So that way, when you go to get funding or request funding, you can show them your P&L statements and they'll, they'll, look sufficient and and legitimate for that company to be able to give you money or want to give you money. So what we're doing is we're breaking things down a little bit at a time in bite-sized pieces. And if you are already, if you already have a business, this is even more for you because a lot of times we have businesses, but we're not properly aligned to take that business to the next level. So if you're a starter or if you already have a business and you just need some mentorship, some coaching to help you um, get those secrets to, to help you take that business to the next level, that's what we're doing for people. And it's a, you know, it's a it's a struggle because um, but it's, it also goes back to that person. You know, what you put out is what you're going to get, but we're going to be here to support you. Yep. I found, so I started as a business consultant helping startups and, um, I found that everything that you're saying right now is what they have not thought about, Mm -hmm. or there wasn't enough, um, valid information because they can Google it, but then you have a hundred different sites. Yeah. You have a hundred different sites telling you a hundred different things and it just creates more confusion surrounding, you know, should I stay a sole proprietor or I'm an LLC? Is it the right time to transition to an S corp or should my business be a corporation because I'm a professional, right? And now places like Chicago, they're requiring P LLCs. So it's Mm -hmm. like all of these things that is kind of convoluted with a simple Google search and you need guidance. You need to invest in yourself and pay for a course and pay to be a part of some sort of like cohort, cohort, like you're saying with someone who's going to hold your hand and kind of walk you through this process. Because I always say like, you need to invest in yourself at a certain point in your career. There's only so much free stuff that's going to be given to you because people will provide value. But then it gets to a point where it's like, 
I need to take the next step. Mm -hmm. So that's definitely, and kind of going back to what you were saying about target, target audience, and like identifying your niche and things like that. On my TikTok right now, pretty much all of my followers on there are people who are looking to start businesses. Mm -hmm. And I, my target audience for my TikTok is minorities, like minority businesses or some sort of anybody that falls into an equal opportunity category. So the LGBT community, the, you know, veteran community, things like that, dis this disabled community. So I find that when those individuals come to me, they're like, I am a veteran and I want to start a business serving other veterans. And I'm like, that's good, but we need to get a little bit more specific than that. Mm -hmm. And I think that what you're doing will answer a lot of those questions because it's just things you don't think about. A lot of people have their eye on the prize and mm -hmm. it's like, there's a lot of steps in between. So it's phenomenal that you're doing that. So mm -hmm. how does the cohort work? So if folks sign up now, which I'll leave a link in the description. If mm -hmm. they sign up now in January is kind of like the kickoff. So is it's online, I'm assuming. Can you talk a little bit about like the setup? Yeah. So it's going to be all virtual training. So it can be a national and an national setup right so it'll all be online um you'll get the link once you sign up you'll start get get getting information course information um information you know information on to to help you follow along um in january it's like a graduating class so let's say it's your junior year in high school right you're going to get to you start with that class you end with that class and then at the end in december we'll have a, a celebration and award ceremony and you know for, for everybody who actually completes that training but you start with the group and you end that's what the cohort is about so it's not like just a bunch of and, and that's good too for networking purposes because it's a bunch of entrepreneurs we can all help build each other up in certain ways whether you are a realtor you may be a contractor you may be whatever we all have have something for each other so you get to kind of know people get to build your your community but every month we're going to tackle a different very important part of building a business or legitimizing a business and we're just taking our time going through that and giving you time to actually execute it with us there to support you so it's a whole year it's a whole year program that it's is not Standing. It's not like a three day program, but let me say yeah. this because you mentioned it, Jess. And um, what what we see a lot of the times is a lot of small business or people. You got these big dreams. Yeah, you know, I want to. I'm about to do this. I'm about to. I'm a rapper. Whatever. Um, I'm about to sell skates. You know, and I see an opportunity. It's a lot of skaters. I'm about to make hundred and fifty thousand dollars. They have no research to support no. that. <laughs> Don't even know how to support that. You know, data. Um, where are you going to start your sales? How much is it going to cost? They don't understand that stuff, right? But the problem is they go on YouTube University where they're trying to get all this free information and these pipe dreams. A lot of these people, they're not, they are not educated. They might not even have a, a business, but they mm -hmm. got a lot of clickbait off of other things and they're selling that, right? But people buy into it because it sounds good. It sounds hype. You know, I, I get people be like, yeah. I need to buy a foreclosure and I'm gonna put that in the trust. And then tomorrow, and I'm just like, wait, <laughs> because YouTube University make things sound like, okay, yep. let me really help you set up. It ain't go, it, it's not that easy, but with the right support, you can. But if you are really serious about your business being successful, everything is not free. <laughs> yep. Do not yep. look and think that everything you do is, is free um and and you looking for all this free there is a lot of free information to get you started but like you said when you are really serious and you're ready to take it to the next level and you see an opportunity to um to build wealth for your families through your business it might be time for you to really get a mentor yeah. get support i have two mentors that help mm -hmm. me and i'm looking i'm interviewing another one right now um because you know for for this business so you know, you got to pay to play if you want to take it to the big leagues. And it's okay if you yeah. don't. Everybody's not meant for this world. But if yeah. you do want to be here, just, just know that YouTube University may not be the best place yeah. to uh, think that you can really build a bit. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, like I said, I initially started off as a business consultant helping startups. And I actually transitioned out of that niche and became an investor. So I was an angel mm -hmm. investor for a really long time. 
Mm-hmm. And then uh, through the angel network. And then I ended up, um, and for anybody who doesn't know, it kind of works like Shark Tank where I invest in your business for a percentage of the business, for a percentage of the mm-hmm. equity until, you know, and I can exit whenever I want. I can stay whenever I want, depending on how much of the business I own. I could be a voting member on decisions. And that it just depends on how much your business is valued at and how much money I give you. But mm-hmm. I transitioned from the angel network because you have to do everything through the angel network. So they get a percentage of it. It's kind of like a, it's an interesting place to be. So I became an independent investor and I would ask, so through, through the grapevine, people would find me, especially other veterans. And I will, I will listen to everybody. If, if you say you have a business and you're looking for an investor, I will give you the time of day. But if you can't answer my questions, I cannot invest in your business. And it's because they don't know the basics. So like taking Mm -hmm. your course will at least let them understand the questions I'm asking them. So like we're saying with the P&L. So if I say, what, what is your profit and loss? What is your profit and loss statement look like? Right. How much revenue are you bringing in? What is the cost of goods sold? What is your overhead? Mm -hmm. And I get a lot of times I get, well, you know, we're in the negative right now, (laughs) but we're going to make a hundred thousand dollars next year. And I'm like, how come you didn't make a hundred thousand yeah. dollars this year? Like, <laughs> yeah. And, and tell how? me, and can you tell me how? Can you? I understand business. Uh, your first three years of business, you're not expected to to make money, but you are expected to have a the sustained growth and and really have processes and see a plan. If you're looking for for investors, they want to see that you have a plan and you know what you're doing. You understand uh, balance sheets and all the, all the things, yeah. right? Cost of goods sold. If I ask you, what's your cost of goods sold? And you'd be like, yeah, this t-shirt costs $17. Okay. How much money are you making off that t-shirt? Yes. Oh, yeah. well, you know, we bought it for $5. Okay. But did you have to have it shipped? Did you have to, all yep. these little details, did you have to pay for marketing? All those details add up and they ultimately cut up in your uh, they off they ultimately come up in your profit, which affects your profit and loss statements, which affects your balance sheets. Um, and if you can't answer that, it's it's questionable because a person like me would probably look at your stuff like, what? Okay, no. Yeah. no. And then I you see, can have a great product, but yeah. if you don't know and what you're doing, I'll ask questions about marketing too. And I think it's I, that. So I love that your course is a year because I feel like if you. If you learn a single topic, you need to sit with that topic. You need to execute that task. And that's not going to happen overnight because we have lives and we're running a business. It's not something that we can just like stop and spend a week on. So having essentially the month to kind of like get it together and then bring that with you to the following course. Plus it's not as overwhelming, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I love that it's, it's spread out because these are, you know, executable tasks over the course of a year. And that is amazing because yeah i i had somebody just the other day starting a business he wants me to invest in his business and i asked him you know what's your customer acquisition cost because you're spending ten thousand dollars a year in advertising and marketing how much of that advertising and marketing breaks down to your clients like how much are you getting back and he just couldn't provide that number he just knows he's running instagram ads for ten dollars a day every single day and it's like all right like did you split test like kind of what's coming back from that and is it effective marketing that's targeting your your niche your target audience so no that's that's phenomenal so if folks want to get in on this cohort um, is there a maximum class size or just limited number of seats can you kind of talk about kind of the that aspect yeah we try to limit it to 15 to 20, um, 20 people per class. And that's because, like I said, we're really giving you guys time and energy and effort. And we want to make sure that we have the capacity to answer questions. But I think next year we're probably going to start a mid, um, a mid-season new cohort team, probably like in the summer, in the spring. I'm sorry, around June time frame is what we're considering. So if you are very interested and you come on, you got to sign the waiver, you're going to sign the information, you got to put your deposit down. Um, and if you're really interested, we'll just, if you can't make it into this cohort, because, you know, my prayer always is that, you know, we're going to list it and it's going to sell out in the next two weeks, you know. But for whatever reason, if you uh, can't make it in, don't worry. We'll keep you in our uh, database and we'll let you know when the next cohort start. And hopefully we can be a part of taking your business to the next level. Yep. I think that's so important. Now I'm a high ticket coach now. So I only help established businesses 
and I am not cheap, but that's for a reason. Um, And I even find that businesses that, so my clients, they're doing six and seven figures in terms of revenue. There are still gaps in, Mm -hmm. in their business plan and in their business structure. So I have somebody, I have a new client right now who just purchased a, I, I live in wine, the wine country. So he just purchased a vineyard. Mm-hmm. And he's seen a bottle of wine. And I was like, okay, so I'm going through his like business plan and his documentation. He got a $1 million loan from the bank mm-hmm. and he has a business partner. So I'm kind of going through all of this. He's partnered with um, an actor who's, I can't say who, but he lives in California. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. um, so I'm going through and I'm like, we have an actor, famous person who has tons of money. And I'm like, you don't have a marketing strategy. <laughs> Even if you are the marketing strategy because you have all of this attention, 2 million followers on social media, you don't even have a marketing strategy. So I'm like, you need to go to this course. <laughs> like, you need to take this course and fill in those gaps. So I think it's important for business owners to understand that you can also reap the benefits of going to a course like this because yeah. someone like me goes through your stuff with a fine tooth comb, just like a bank would or an underwriter would. And we see these gaps, that's a problem. The only reason why they got a $1 million loan was because they have $10 million in the bank. Mm -hmm. So it was a low risk loan for the bank. But unless you're in that position, which not many of us are, Mm -hmm. you need to fill those gaps because the bank will be like, nope, because of whatever gap that needs to be filled. So yeah, thanks for sharing that. I'm going to leave a link to your course and your social media in the description. The last thing I wanted to kind of talk about before we wrap things up is how are you doing after service? How are things going for you? I kind of know you're like bi-coastal right now. So yeah. um, do you want to talk a little bit about life after service and how you've been able to find success after the Navy? Oh my God. You know, I love it. You, I, you know, people get, again, another fear, right? I joined the Navy from having nothing went to the Navy. And when I realized like, okay, I love what I'm doing, but I know that there was something different for me. Like I said, I started real estate in 2014 while I was still on active duty. And um, just so realizing that there was, there was another life for me. I was looking forward to that. Um, And just having the freedom and the flexibility of my mind. Like, I feel like while I was active duty, there's this box that you're kind of put in and you're forced to operate in that, that box. But when I got out, I realized I have the skills. I'm smart enough. I don't have to stay in this box anymore. This the sky can't even hold me. Like I can do whatever I want to do um, reasonably and not without hurting people. But um, like you said, I'm by coastal. I I have my business in California. I have my business in Florida. I'm building my business in Georgia now. And I just I, I'm back and forth. I'm back and forth. We travel. We we've been. We just got back from Puerto Rico. I, it's just it's just been lovely I would say yeah and uh, for anybody who has fear of getting out or, or transitioning that is completely understandable it, you know the Navy makes life kind of easy for you but the fact that the fact of the matter is there is a life outside of that and finding who you are when you take that uniform off like she said I'm a master chief she didn't realize I made master chief because at the end of the day it's a part of who you are but it does not fully define you you have to be able to define who you are and it comes from your heart and when you take that uniform off people ain't walking around calling me master chief nation they're calling me Renisha and I need to be strong enough and able to stand behind that and what does that what does Renisha what does that mean you know it means a lot to me and it means a lot to the people that I care about beyond the limited amount of people who called me master chief, you know, which I, I love being a master chief. I'm not, <laughs> I ain't taking that away, you know, but yeah. that was a part of, it's still a part of me. It's a part of me right now. It's always going to be a part of me, but it does not fully define my story. There is, and it won't define your story. Oh, AO2, BM3, you know, those, yeah. they'll always be a part of your story, but it's just a part. Just know that. Yeah, no, I think that's really important. Whenever I do my weekend warrior stuff, I meet other reservists who don't realize that the military is giving you so much. Like you can do so much with what you have and what the military is providing. Just take advantage of that and use that to build that inner person. So 
But I mean, thank you so much for being here. Um, thank you for being a service to others. I'm a faithful person. So I think that God kind of had our paths cross again after service. So I'm uh, I'm really fortunate to have you here. And I would love to have you back to talk real estate and to kind of talk a little bit about kind of maybe as we get closer to your uh, course starting or even that second course over the summer, because um, I, I think that is phenomenal. I didn't know it was cohort style which if anybody doesn't know how cohort style works, that's so amazing. So thank you so much for, for being here and talking a little bit about that. And uh, yeah, I, I wish you all the best. We'll, we'll be in touch for sure. And if anybody yeah, needs a definitely. realtor in California, are you a realtor in Florida also? Yeah, I'm in Florida. I'm, I can help anybody nationwide. Honestly, I'm with the National Brokerage. And if you need help, support, I love training. I love doing what I do. Don't, don't hesitate. Awesome. And then do you have... If you just, I'll throw it up on the screen post, but do you have a specific website that folks can go to, to sign up for the cohort, to find out some more information about the class? No, we haven't launched that yet. We'll be launching that at the end of this month. But if you follow me on my social media, they're all Renisha Nation or Renisha underscore Nation in some capacity, um, sure. R-O-N-E-S-H-A Nation, like United Nation. Um, so you just follow me. You'll be able to keep up with me that way. Feel free to inbox me, send me information, my DMs. I also, I also have YouTube um, so if you are following you through YouTube or TikTok, I'm on all of the social media sites, LinkedIn, um, and I'll be happy to make sure you get that information and hopefully we can support you through your business building. Awesome. I will throw the link up somewhere here, but it'll also be in the description. And then this episode will obviously be on my website, which will also have all of the links to your, um, to your businesses and your social media. So yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm.